future of renewable energy and agriculture, and that's me up there. I've been at the University of Florida for 21 years. They used my picture as the banner for the HR department, I think solely because I've had so many different jobs. A brief bio, I figured rather than talk about a whole bunch of stuff, I'd give you my life and pictures. Uh, Citrus Concentrate, uh, we did some consulting work in that, my first job out of college. I took a few courses in uh, some airspace heat transfer areas, re well, she just changed my resume, worked in military and civilian aerospace for a while, um, made laser uh, designator and targeting and referencing uh, uh, computers and, and uh, laser systems, uh, did the cooling systems for that, um, which is nothing but heat transfer. I uh, got bored with that. Once you do one cooling system, you've done them all. And so uh, uh, the situation there is that uh, I moved on to the International Space Station in Huntsville, Te uh, Huntsville, Texas, Huntsville, Alabama. I did that for five years, got really bored with that. Uh, why? Um, well, they flew what I worked on six years after I left. Okay, so again, um, and then moved to Florida, worked in extension, many different jobs there, a lot of fun doing different projects there in the water, wastewater industry, solar, residential housing, energy efficient housing, lots of changes there. Um, I teach mostly, um, 100% teaching appointment, so I have a lot of involvement with the students. One thing we found, I gave them a homework assignment a while back and said, go to the California Energy Commission website and list all the things you can find about best management practices regarding energy in California. Oh, they filled pages. I said, okay, next week, do the same thing in Florida. About the middle of the week, like, Dr. Porter, we're not finding anything. Correct. Yeah, we're a little bit behind in some of those things. But we do have some things going on. One of the things, Rural Energy Application Pro Program, REAP, we have grants out there. Did I mangle that abbreviation? I'm sure I did. But um, we have projects all over the country. Most of them are up north or northern states, and they focus on processing. That doesn't help uh, states like Florida and Texas as much because we have a lot of grazing a lot of groves, a lot of motive powers used. So we used a lot of tractor, a lot of things in the field that use a lot of diesel fuel. So if you're looking at how I process eggs or dairy or chill milk, then those programs have focused mainly on that. And so what we try to do is take a look at how we use um, energy in some of the more traditional areas. I did an anecdotal survey of my students and found that their uh, fuel tanks on the farm were actually Rust-Oleum Red and um, uh, out in the sun, uh, no shade, um, over concrete, and with a gooseneck cap on it, a top to it. Uh, the evaporative losses alone makes probably the best uh, time you want to spend all year in changing that, maybe paint it a reflective color, plant some grass around it, put a pressure cap on it, some small changes, and all of a sudden you've saved somebody's really nice Christmas bonus. So uh, trying to get the students to look at some of these things. We're used to producing our own power, on farms, at least we were in the past. Um, anybody recognize that in the upper right? That's an old Delco. They didn't actually have the whole explanation, just had to say, we've got a Delco. That stands for Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company. And since I used to live outside of Dayton, Ohio, and worked with my uncle in a tool and die shop, we made parts for Delco. But not that, I'm not that old. Okay, and there's an old hit or miss down there. What's interesting is if you look at the um, fuel to electricity production efficiency of that Delco, it's just under the current PV panels that you can buy today. At, uh, that was about 20%, and the production line, top of the line marks are hitting at about 23% right now. So delve into renewable energy, and what are we talking about, renewable energy? Um, basically, we're looking at PV, photovoltaic power, wind power, um, geothermal, using the heat of the earth, um, things of that nature. Biomass, uh, biomass gets a lot of play and it gets a lot of heat because people automatically assume that you're mowing down old growth forests. What they don't realize in the forest products industry, there's a lot of leftover product. You know, if I'm going to grow a forest and I want to make wood products out of it, the highest value is lumber, dimensional lumber. And after that, I might take the 
uh, chips left over to make chipboard or OSB, the mulch I could use, the bark I'd use for mulch. But after that, you get to the point where not even the forest product industry will use that. Spe particularly in a pulp and paper operation, when you mow down a whole plot of land, there's stuff that won't make it past the scales at the processing plant, and that stuff typically is grubbed up into a big pile and burnt right there in place in Florida. And so you have all the attendant air pollution, particulate pollution, CO2, the whole nine yards. And so using that to produce electricity um, is actually beneficial in terms of cutting down the localized uh, pollution. The wind towers there, I think the newest wind power towers in the world are eight megawatts and the hub height is 105 meters. The nacelle is 392 tons. That's a big kahuna. We have photovoltaic we put on roofs. We also put on ground. But where is that leading us? We looked at earlier data. We showed the smaller percentages on there. So what's happening in the future with those sources of energy? Up in the top left corner is a picture of Wall Street, the actual physical Wall Street in 1900. What's the motive power there? Oxes, horses, cattle, and our own two feet. Now imagine a, a father, successful business making carriages, and he's got two sons, 17 and 19 in 1900. There's 8,000 cars in America. All the signs are there, and he's got this successful business he's going to pass on to his sons. A few short la years later, there are 8 million cars in the United States, and the next picture you see is Wall Street covered with cars. In 2004, there was a million users of this weird social media thing called Facebook. It's the only way I can keep track of my kids. I'm guilty. In 2012, we had a billion users. A billion users. One million to a billion, a factor of 1,000. There is one of our earlier computers. Mechanical switches, a room full of parts. Remember the famous head of IBM? Uh, Tom Watson said, what, we maybe need like six supercomputers for the whole country? And a few short years later, we have 125 million desktop computers. These are tipping points. What causes these things to happen? Well, first off, the barriers to market entry are removed. Now, they can be regulatory barriers, which Texas is one of the leaders. We have this, image, this thought process of what certain states do and certain states don't do. But again, how many people outside of Texas know that Texas is a leader in wind power? and that regulatory changes they did over 20 years ago allow access to the grid much more conveniently than many other states and many other states that are somehow called leaders in this. So, interesting thought process there, but usually barriers are thought of in terms of price. How about the new things are better than the alternatives? You know, it got to the point in our cities such as New York City where we spent a lot of labor cleaning up after the horses. And what were we going to do with all this pollution? So we've had to deal with transportation pollution before, and we'll do it again. The last part is something that uh, probably goes to, uh, the head of that goes to Steve Jobs or Elon Musk of Tesla. They provide a service or function we didn't even know we needed. How many have us a smartphone in our pockets, right? Yeah, I got one of those, only I'm not the smart end of that deal, so I, I can't figure out to use half the things it'll do. But we have all these changes. So what about new tipping points? Wind power, photovoltaic, LED light bulbs. You know, the technological arc on LED light bulbs, right now they're at 100 lumens per watt, which means you can replace a 60-watt bulb with 8 watts. The technological arc, the laboratory arc, will get us down to about 4 watts to replace a 60-watt bulb. 4 watts. At that point, and I think about, well, we'll just use more lighting. When this comes on board, it'll be cheap. We won't really save anything more. No, we're fully saturated market when it comes to lighting. And they last a long time. I've bought my last Dairy Queen compact fluorescent probably three or four years ago. I'm replacing everything with LED watts. 
Just as an example, my carriage lots, my lights on my driveway, when I moved into the house, they were metal halide, 250 watt, watts a piece with ballast energy in them. I was 550 watts for my driveway lights. I could read the paper walking in in the winter in the morning. Heck, I could have probably lit the paper on fire if I'd held it over. <laughs> I mean, really. So when the first one burned out and I went to Hughes Electric and said, I need a new light bulb, and they said, it's $40. I'm on a state salary. I said, $40? You're out of your mind. Um, well, that might have been true, but he was still right. It was $40. Okay, so I put in compact fluorescence. I changed the whole fixture, and I changed it to 23 watts each. So I went from 550 to 46 watts. I was really proud of myself. Time went on, I found some outdoor LED lights. Now, I don't need to read the newspaper walking in they, to mark the driveway. I replaced that with two watt light bulbs. So I went from 550 to four watts. So that's a market transformation right there. Microgrids is a market transformation. We have island communities now that are going fully renewable because they used to do diesel fuel. And this is cheaper to do. Wind power and photovoltaic are growing by leaps and bounds all over the world. The freight containers up there is probably a different story. When you're done with your electric batteries and your Prius, your Leaf, your Teslas, you know, they're no good for cars anymore. Car battery, you know, to really run it is a really tough job. When you wear it out for a car, it's still got a lot of life left on it. So they recondition them, put them in a freight container, and now they're battery storage for these island communities to level out the use of, and again, uh, our renewable energies is not unpredictable, they're variable. Frankly, I know when the sun comes up every day, and I kind of depend on it. The weather is statistical, I can depend on that too. Same with the wind, the Danes have also done a lot of work in wind and they've got predictive tools there. They can tell you the output of their wind farms with a four hour window. Now a four hour window is a lot better window when the oil feed for journal bearing number seven goes out in your steam turbine and you have to pull a thousand megawatts off the line with 30 seconds warning. So again, they have their own abilities. A kind of a funky chart there. The bottom, I'm gonna go out of order. The bottom graph there is my own house, 2001. This is what I used. 22,000 kilowatt hours a year in a ranch style house. You know what ranch style means? It means when the roof goes, you pay a lot of money to replace it. It also means it wasn't insulated very well and was built in a time period when we paid two cents a kilowatt hour. So again, I worked for the state, you know, so I figured I didn't want to pay that bill. It's like Groucho Marx. I wouldn't pay that bill if I were you. Okay, so I cut down the use of my own electric power by simple things I could do around the house. Now the red curve is where I'm at right now. And notice the first thing off the bat is my amplitude is really smashed. Now the grid loves that because I don't stress the grid. I don't have those peak enormous months where I'm really killing the grid. I've smashed that flat. Instead of 2,700 kilowatt hours of peak in January, I've got about 1,000. I'm not done yet. I got three other things I need to do at the house and I'll be at the green line pretty soon. The only thing that uh, prevents me from doing that is my day job interferes with my weekends. But anyway, the other curve up in the top there is the duck's back. Have you heard of the duck's back in the utility industry? Well, the duck's back is if I keep putting renewable energy in here, I'm going to give that duck a sway back. It's like I'm making them carry luggage for me. So I dump PV in the middle of the day, and I move the grid during the middle of the day down. And then the ramp up to the evening hours is so steep, I'm going to kill the grid. And that's the argument to not change. And a bunch of other people have gone, are you kidding me? Just move the profile. How do I move the profile? Well, I can store energy in my water heater. I get cheap electrical, or cheap renewable energy coming in during the day from uh, a, a, like a wind power park. And I could just call up and say, I'm going to dump an extra five degrees of heat in everybody's wind, or everybody's water heater uh, through a, a hundred thousand water heater community, a million water heaters. So I can store quite a bit. That curve up there is the independent systems operator for California, so that's 35, 40 million people. So we're talking 15 million plus houses. I can store a good chunk of that peak in my water heaters. Changing six light bulbs out per household would get rid of most of the rest of the peak, 
and I have not had the reason to go to anything like the Tesla Powerwall or some technology like that. I've just moved my profile. And I get rid of the sway back during the middle of the day because I just move the use. Now, say we have more of a market penetration. The growth rate in electric cars this year was 60%. Even though it's microscopic, growth rates like that will change the market fairly quickly. There's a type of mill foil or, or duckweed or something on our lakes in Florida that by the time you see it, it's too late. The next growth will cover the lake. Okay, so the power of exponential growth. But um, what happens if I bring 50 customers in, not 50 customers, 50 um, workers into an office building, 25 of them have electric cars. I can buy power from them. The plug-in that I put in can go both ways sell power to the car when I need to charge, or push power to the building. So a situation there is, I don't want to pay demand charges. Demand charges are peak charges you have to pay for the demand for a big commercial business for those hours of the day, usually in the afternoon, usually air conditioning. So I go to my workers and say, listen, can I get 10% of your battery capacity every day? I'll pay you for it. I'll pay you nicely for it. And I'll let you charge for free in the morning. These things are already happening. And I thought of these, and I think, no, they can't be doing that. Well, the internet is our friend, so I dialed up a Google search on Wi-Fi controlled water heaters. Yes, Rheem already sells a Wi-Fi controlled water heater, and the um, GE uh, Geospring heat pump water heater also has a Wi-Fi controlled module you can put on it for relatively cheap. So yes, that technology is already here. What do we got? We saw that earlier in a, in a slide, uh, basically 1.45 billion megawatt hours from coal, uh, 1.3 billion megawatt hours from uh, natural gas, nuclear is about 0.8, hydroelectricity during this drought is usually around 0.3, but it's down a little bit because of California and the drought. Other renewables about 0.28. The key issue there is that's the first time in this country where other renewables, which is not hydroelectricity, but wind, PV, biomass, geothermal, uh, things of that nature, has surpassed hydroelectric. That happened in 2014. That will probably never go back. Total electric use in this country is about 4 billion megawatt hours a year. What's happening? What are the arcs? What are the trends on this? Well, coal is dropping dramatically. The trend we're on this year, we have um, August data in already for the coal consumption, coal production, excuse me. Um, if the trend continues, we will be on par of producing coal in this country at the rate of 1986. So that's a fairly significant trend. Natural gas grew extensively about four or five years ago, but has stayed right in the 1.2 to 1.3 billion megawatt hours for the last three or four years. Hydro, uh, nuclear power, um, I think we have five reactors being built and we have five being decommissioned. That's not changed a whole lot for the last 20 years. Um, hydroelectricity, again, is varying in a very narrow range. Um, wind power in this country is growing at about 20% a year, 20% a year on an average growth rate. We have high years and low years based on what we think is going to happen to the producer tax credit. PV is on a 30 plus percentage gain a year. In 1994, when I went to work at the University of Florida, uh, the world produced 60 megawatts of PV, and this year we'll produce about 57,000 megawatts in the world. Um, that's a long-term growth rate of about 38%. That growth rate, if continued, exceeds the penetration of smartphones in our economy. So think about that as a comparison, how fast that changed our lives. Okay, PV is on a rocket that is exceeding those growth rates. Now, overall, the electricity use in this country has changed a bit in 10 years. Now, local markets have. We have changes in different states, but nationally, it's been 4 billion megawatt hours a year for the last 10 years. We've added 30 million people in this country, I mean, equal to whole countries in Europe, and yet we have not added any electricity use in the country. That's because our efficiency our attitude about efficiency in that aspect of our lives has kind of taken some um, leaps and bounds, a lot of changes in there. So what's next? What if we just continue these trends that we're on? Again, looking back at tipping points, 
and what makes a tipping point happen. The prices are continually dropping in these areas. So if we become more efficient because we have better products, LED lights, energy efficient appliances, um, we are actually insulating our houses better these days. 40% of the houses in this country don't have effective insulation in their attic. So there's a lot of ways we can change that market. If we continually work on the energy efficiency aspect of our electric market and PV and wind stay on the same trends, we have moderate changes to things like geothermal and biomass, then what you'll have 10 years from now is 0.8 billion megawatt hours from wind, 0.8 from PV, let's see, 0.8 from nuclear power, because I don't think that's going to change a whole lot either way in the next 10 years. Um, hydroelectric is about 0.3, geothermal and biomass about 0.3, that's about 3 billion megawatt hours. That's it. An energy efficient economy in America would use about 3 billion megawatt hours a year. We use 4 billion, you think you're crazy. We're not going to knock a billion off, we'd all have to suffer. No. No, that's not, uh, again, back to my house, my uh, utility bill um, uh, last uh, year, the minimum bill was $58. I live in a 2,250 square foot ranch style house with an electric well and a pool. The pool is not green, um, the lights are on, the computer's on, the TV's on, and I can assure you the beer in the refrigerator is cold. Um, so the efficiency market has a huge, huge run in front of us, and our venture capital groups are putting a lot of money into that. Um, utility aggregation and disaggregation and data analytics of our utility bills is showing the way to really look at this and figure out the fact that it's cheaper to save or use energy more efficiently than it is to build another power plant. The old Public Service Commission model was if I needed one more megawatt hour, I just build another power plant and I charged the customers for that and added my 10% on for my profit and I sold utility stocks because they were very predictable. One of the things that's happened in the last three or four years in Queensland, Australia, in our own Midwest, and in Germany, is that we have had times when our spot market for electricity, the price for it, went to zero or even negative. I'll pay you to take my power. Zero. That used to be a place where utilities made their profit for the year was wheeling power. And now I have this market trend that says, man, I, that, that's broken. I don't know how to do that anymore. So change is afoot. That's a picture of Australia. I wonder why I'm focusing on Australia. You know, you, you graduate your kids from college, you're really proud, you, and, and your daughter, oh, travel, see the world. Oh, she traveled to Australia and married an Australian. Right. <laughs> right. So we get to visit. But... I can't just go visit the, the Airbnb bed and breakfast place we stayed at. Can I borrow your utility bills? You got the natural gas bill too? How about your water bill? So I went through her bills to analyze what was happening in Australia. They have the largest electrical grid in the world in terms of distance. It goes all the way from the north all the way to, uh, you know, around that corner from Adelaide, Adelaide all the way up to Port Douglas or Port Lincoln. I can't get them straight. The key issue there is look at Darwin, look at Perth, look at Alice Springs. They're disconnected. They are their own microgrids. They are their own microgrids. They take care of themselves locally. How about Kodiak Island in our own country? You know, they used to ship in diesel fuel to run their electricity. Now they do wind and hydroelectric, putting in a little bit of battery to even things out. Think about our communities. These are small, isolated communities. Small, isolated, importing power and losing young people. We have many small communities in Texas. We have many small communities in Florida that have this same issue. One of the things that local power does for you, it brings the jobs back locally. A lot of the money when I have a centralized power plant, a lot of the money goes to some other state in terms of fuel. It doesn't happen when you do renewable energy. Um, digesters, uh, to me, that covers a whole bunch of things because we have a problem with pollution, with our poultry and our cattle processing, our, our uh, feedlots, our dairy. And one way we can get around that is to actually digest that. Um, it produces quite a bit of power. 
Now imagine a local grid that has some solar, some wind. I made everybody get efficient because I, it made it attractive. I have a local community. Now the local co-op, electric co-op, can call up all the digester people and say, listen, how about if you sell your power when nothing else is running? Don't sell it just when your stuff is running. We'll pay you to sell it when we need it. So now you've closed the loop and you've made a local power community. I found an NREL study of Colorado and they took the unused corners of center pivot and said, well, what if we put solar in that part? And they were pretty religious about getting rid of things that were already being used for something or didn't fit geographically or topographically and just used what they could that where they thought they could and they found out that just using the unused corners of center pivot in Colorado, they could come up with 57 million megawatt hours, which currently happens to be more than the state of Colorado uses. So again, that's a, 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 when we talk about land uses and can we find the land to do these things, that was one example. That, the picture in the middle and the top that I like, those are freight containers um, filled with solar panels as far as the eye can see. Um, Washington State, there's some people from Washington State, that's a digester, um, a sunken in the ground digester to give it a little bit better heat retention. Um, and Washington State claims that they're the digester capital of the country. They have more there than anybody else. Um, I would refuse to argue with that one. Uh, Vermont has quite a few digesters there, but they are a much smaller state. So uh, again, uh, kudos to Washington State on that. And there's a wind power park being put together and built right there. So energy efficient first, you know, when you talk about timeline, becoming more energy efficient, and why do I keep poking at that? Our first, our developed country partners, fully developed, well, I call them first world nation, but I, I hate to be so arrogant by saying somebody else is behind that, but um, our trading partners that are fully developed use about 6,000 kilowatt hours a year per person, 6,000 per person. We use about 13,000. We are not competing. It's not a question of can we do something, it's should we do something. That means that the bottom line, they can always beat us on a bid because they spend less money on utilities than we do and less effort on it. So once you get past that, another thing, rooftop solar is really good because it's right where you use it. We have six to eight percent distribution losses right now in our grid. That's a huge amount of power. If I put it right on my roof, I've got literally no distribution losses. Again, commercial solar and then utility solar, these things are being added on. Wind farms, um, I like, personally I like digesters because it covers so many problems. The pollution, the extra profit line for the producers, for the ag people. And again, local power produces local jobs. The world market, here's the kicker. It doesn't matter what we do here in the Southeast. You know, we can be a leader or a follower in these areas. That's not the point. The point is the world's already voted. 57,000 megawatts of PV added this year. 52,000 megawatts, and I'm projecting to the end of the year with the best possible data I can find. 52,000 megawatts of wind power, about 40,000 megawatts of hydroelectric. If you put that together with the capacity factors they normal run, or normally run at, then you're gonna produce about 2.3% of the world's electricity with what's being added this year. 10 years, that's 23%. We already project, we already have 35% of our electricity worldwide being produced with non-fossil fuel sources. So at that point, 10 years from now, we're at 60%. We've changed the market in 10 years. Utility scale PV by 2017 uh, will be around a dollar a watt. I can sell that in commercial at 12 cents a kilowatt hour, so that means I can buy something for a dollar and sell power at 25 cents. That's 25% rate of return. That's pretty good money. Wind power is $1.70 a watt and falling. Um, again, those rates of returns are fairly nice. So no matter what happens in the U.S., the world has already changed. Kenya is putting in nothing but renewable energy. The fossil fuel centralized electric grid, which brought us to this dance and did a darn fine job doing so, never was going to provide electricity to two billion people in other parts of the world. 
because it took so much capital and so much infrastructure to put together to do that. Renewable energy will. Kenya is going right on PV, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric. And they will completely bypass us, much like they, the rest of the world has done with cell phones. We never put in a centralized phone system all over the world because all of a sudden we had a technology that says we don't need to. The part where it gets into agriculture, the grid transformation happens on the edges first. And that's us. We have the land. We have the need. We have the extra product that we can use in different ways to produce renewable power locally. So we have all these opportunities to get involved with this activity. So that, to me, is my version of what's happening in the next 10 years um, and what we're going to lead into. Uh, I'll entertain any questions. And thank you very much for allowing me to be here. <laughs>